okay so this is lecture 45 seems like a long course a never ending course keeps on going okay so we are looking at this model for hard ml decoding right the model that i introduced okay looks like some lots of interesting activity going on there it's okay okay so the model we had is as follows you have a message m k bits which you encode as before to get a code word c which is n bits and then instead of going through this exercise of converting to bpsk adding noise and anyway making hard decision symbol wise you might have an equivalent model where this goes through a binary symmetric channel with probability of error p and this p you can compute from the uh, awgn model sq of 1 by c okay so you get a vector b which is once again n bits okay i asked you a question about the distribution for b okay so if you think about it you have to condition on c okay so conditioned on c b will be kind of a binomial around c right so so it will be that kind of a distribution so the vectors around c will get a certain uh, weight according to that and then you have to add up all those conditioning so that's how the distribution will look okay so think about that so so b is but b in particular can be any one of the two par n possibilities there's no restriction or anything else. okay <coughs> so this process we also modeled by an error vector which was n bits and this ei was actually the components of this vector e say e sub i it was 1 with probability p and 0 with probability 1 minus p okay so that was the way in which we thought about it. okay so now then i claimed a hard ml decoder is going to output a c hat which is given by this very simple expression argument of minimum over c in c okay the code is c the hamming distance between b and c okay so out of all the received from the received vector look at all the code words find out the hamming distance pick that one which gave you which was closest to you in hamming distance if you have more than one once again you can pick any one doesn't matter doesn't change probability so this is the ml rule as in it maximizes the or minimizes the probability of error Okay, so in this setup, okay, so it's the best. You can't do anything better than that. Okay, so but uh, from an implementation point of view, this could be difficult, as in uh, you have you have no way of prioritizing C. You don't know which C to test first, right? So instead of doing this, it might be interesting to find E. Okay, so it seems like an uh, seems like uh, seems like a pointless thing to do, right? Why why am I interested in finding E instead of finding C? Okay, so but I gave you a brief. explanation for why that may be but that might be beneficial because the distribution on c is anything but uniform you know which is most likely and then you know what is more likely so you know you can go in sequence it's a little bit better if you look for e okay but if i find e is that good enough have i actually done e decoding no how do i find c cap from e cap yeah that's all you know which bits were uh, wrong right so you just go flip those bits Okay, so the basic thing to keep in mind is instead of finding C cap, we can equivalently set set what C cap to be B plus E cap, and try to find find the most likely error. Okay, so pick try to find the most likely error vector. If you find the most likely error vector, then you XOR it with B element wise to get your most likely transmitted code word. Okay, so that's an equivalent way of doing it. Okay, so once you do this, things become slightly more simple. Okay, so first of all, let me write down uh, let me write down uh, how this E hat will look. Okay, so what will be an equation for E hat? Okay, so first of all. Okay, so let me not do argument. So, how will I write an equation for E hat? Okay, right. So, if you think about it, so E hat will belong to what? Set of all some n bit vectors, so that what? 
so that what should happen yeah b plus b has to be equal to belong to c okay so even though it looks like e hat can be any one of the two parent possibilities given that you received a b it can be only one of how many possibilities 2 pa k right i mean it has to go back to c so you can't just add any old uh, error vector you want okay so out of these 2 pa k candidate error vectors which one will you pick pick the one with minimum weight because that's the most likely error vector okay so that's the one we'll pick okay so if you want me to write that carefully this argument of minimum having weight of v this set okay 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 i'm sorry minimum over v in this set weight of v i'm sorry just writing so v in this set what do you minimize weight of v okay so you look at all possible error vectors and then pick that one which gave you the least the, that error vector of least weight okay so in this form this decoder becomes very nicely implementable and for the linear code but in specifically we can implement this in the decoder in this form very very easily okay so that that implementation is called the syndrome decoder okay syndrome decoder for linear codes okay i'm going to do this by example for a specific code the generalization will be very very trivial you can do it for any other code it's just the same thing there's no no real difficulty okay so the example i'm going to take is really really simple i'm going to take this uh, Oh, I've been putting away the I comes last, right? In H, okay. So one zero one 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 zero zero one one. Okay. So this is a parity check matrix for a. Uh, what are the parameters of this code? N, K, and D. What are N, K, and D? Of a six three three code. Okay. So remember, six is the block length. Actually, the number of rows of H is n minus k, so you should remember that. But in this case, k and n minus k are the same, so 633 is an easy. So 3 is minimum distance. You can find that also. Obviously. Okay. So now, what is my problem? Given that I received b, I have to find that error vector which will be, which will be of least weight. Okay. So that's what I'm going to find. So let's write this equation. So you know, c hat is b plus e hat. Okay. So for a linear code, one can easily solve for the least weight e hat. Just by using the property that h times c transpose is zero. So you look at h times c hat transpose, you'll get zero, which will be h times b transpose, which will also be h times e hat transpose. Okay. So this set of all v that we had, the set of all error vectors that we had, which is very general for a general code, for a linear code, it becomes really really simple. Okay. What is this set? This set is exactly all those e hats which will solve this equation okay so remember this can be computed okay it can be computed at the receiver eminently computed at the receiver right b you know obviously you can compute h times b transpose and that vector is called the syndrome okay so this is called the syndrome Mm. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I wrote this equation very, very wrongly. I'm sorry. So this will imply H B transpose equals H E transpose. I'm sorry. This, this afternoon class always kills me. Okay. Okay. So this is equal to H B transpose plus H E cap transpose, which will imply obviously H B transpose equals H E transpose. So this is what I defined as the syndrome, and usually it's denoted. S, okay, syndrome S, which is H times E hat transpose. Okay, so what will be the dimensions of S? Three times one. Okay, so it will be a column vector with three, three rows. Okay, three by one. Okay, so this is S. Okay, so all the error vectors which are possible have to satisfy this equation, and you know S at the receiver. Okay, only those vectors, six-bit vectors, which satisfy this equation, are candidate error vectors for you. Okay, out of those candidate error vectors, you have to pick the minimum weight one. So, in fact, it's a linear algebra problem 
with with a kind of a combinatorial twist okay the linear algebra is solution of a linear equation but you have to find that solution with least number of ones which is not really very clearly specified in linear algebra right so that's what makes this problem more difficult and challenge okay so you have to find that e hat which has least number of ones which will solve this equation okay so let's take an example okay let me stick on to this b here Okay, so this is my h. Suppose my b is just pick a random guy, one one zero one one zero. Okay. Suppose this is my b. Okay, what is s? Let me see. H times b transpose. One zero one. Okay, so that seems like the correct answer. I have to now solve for what? <laughs> Looks like people are quickly finding the answer. But anyway, so E one cap, E two cap, E three cap, E four cap, E five cap, E six cap. I have to find. Six variables using how many equations? Three equations. So linear algebra will tell you that the answer is what? Has to have three dimensions. Okay. So you think of a three-dimensional answer, but remember it's only a finite vector space. So there'll be only two power three answers. Okay. So there'll be eight solutions to this equation. It's a set of this uh, the system of equations. But which one do you want? I want that solution of minimum weight. And the best way of doing this, okay, once again, is to start from the least possibilities and keep eliminating okay so it will be best if the all zero code word satisfied this equation then you know there's no problem but clearly all zero won't satisfy okay so all zero will not satisfy so all zero is eliminated okay the next is weight 1 and you can quickly find that there is a weight 1 vector which will give you the answer okay so you see e cap is 1 0 0 0 0 0 and so c cap is 0101 okay so that's syndrome decoding okay so it's very simple there's nothing in it okay so so that, that's how you do syndrome decoding so now you can repeat this for anything else you want okay but the problem comes when you do uh when you go to larger k and n okay suppose if your n minus k is say 100 right and n is 1000 you can't do this very easily Okay, so the numbers will blow up. Okay, so you might say uh, I'm starting from zero. The all ones, how many, how many weight one vectors are there of length n? N, just n. So one plus n doesn't seem too bad. But then quickly it will go to n choose two, n choose three, so on for larger and larger error correct, correcting larger number of errors. We'll go to n choose two, n choose three, and that sum is fairly large. It grows exponentially in uh, in this uh, in n. Okay, so it's a fairly large well. Course, at least with the high polynomial degree, and can be very, very large. Okay, so that's the problem. Less than the larger and larger things, is it? Mm, yeah, you're right, but it depends on where you want to operate, right? So if your bitter rate needs to be really, really small, then you might have to correct uh, many more errors. So it's a question of how many errors you want to correct. You're right. If you don't want to correct more than two errors, or if you know For sure, more than two errors won't won't happen. Yeah, you only incur a quadratic penalty, and not more than that. So it's a choice of how many errors you want to correct. Okay. So is this clear? So hopefully you can repeat this for any other code. Okay. So simple code like this. If I give you a four by seven code, you should be able to write down this equation and uh, do it. So it's uh, it's really simple. Okay. So what people do to simplify things further is do something called a syndrome table. Okay. So you solve all these equations ahead of time. Okay. and then you keep a table so that when you get a received vector you compute the syndrome and from the syndrome you can quickly jump to the solution okay so all these things are standard things that are done and if you are really interested in learning more about these things you, you uh, the lecture notes or actually the lectures of error control coding are also available in my website 
Okay, all you have to do is go to my website and there will be video lectures link and click that and the first few lectures I am sure will cover this in much more detail than your than you realize. Okay, so but for this course this is enough. Okay, so you can correct errors with syndrome decoding. So the question is how many errors can you correct? Okay, how many errors can you correct? Okay, so it seems like a complicated question to ask. Okay, so the way to think about it is you can take a geometric view. Suppose I look at the space of all n bit vectors. Okay, the lot of n bit vectors, 2 power n of them. How many code words do I have? I have 2 power k code words. Okay, so these are like in 2 marks here. Okay, now my error vector gets added on to the code word. So though, though I am transmitting only these points, I might get any point around it. Okay, when more and more errors are made, suppose this is my transmitted code word. Okay, so when more and more errors are made, I will go farther and farther away from my transmitted code word. When will I make an error? When will I decode erroneously? When so many errors have been added that I went closer to another code word. Okay, then I will say the other code word was transmitted. In that case, that error vector was not correctable. I added so many errors so that I went from one code word to another code word. Okay. So now you know any two code words are separated at least by D Hamming distance. So if only if you cross D by 2 roughly, can you ever get closer to some other code word? So if you draw a kind of spheres around each of these code words of radius say t and this t is floor of d minus 1 by 2, you need this d minus 1 by 2 to be precise about the adjustment. Okay, So it's d by 2, you have to be careful about d minus 1 by 2. Okay, If you do that, then these spheres will not intersect at all. Okay, So if I transmit a code word, I will always lie inside this sphere, which means I will always come back to the transmitted code word. Okay. So, for any code with minimum distance d, t equals d minus 1 by 2, floor of that is correctable. Okay. So, for instance, if the minimum distance is 6, right, weight 3 error will not be correctable. Right? 3 will take you exactly to the middle point and you have a 50 percent probability of either choosing one code word or the other code word and you can make an error. So, it is not correctable. So, that is deemed as not correctable. So, having an even minimum distance seems like a wasted uh, thing. So, the odd minimum distance only gives you the error correcting capability. Okay? So, that is a rough way of thinking about it. So, if you have a minimum distance of 5, you can correct 2, two errors for sure. Okay? So, this is with T, right? But see, number of candidate code words uh, errors you have to consider will be n choose t, right? And so that will grow n part t. So if t increases, it in you pay a polynomial penalty in the complexity. Okay. So so for instance, there are codes called Reed Solomon codes for which this t can become very large. Okay. And then you have to come up with a very very smart way of solving those syndrome equations. Okay. So people have come up with very smart ways of doing. It. So that's why Reed Solomon codes are very popular. So, you can solve that equation without incurring any of that huge penalty. So, that is quite non-trivial. You can look at the error control codes if you are interested. Okay? All right. So, this is uh, error correcting capability. So, once you know about error correcting capability, you can find ultimately what? In this course, we are interested in what? Probability of error versus EB over and not. That is what I am interested in. So, once you know this error correcting capability, N, K, N, D and N error correcting capability, you can quickly bound loosely the probability of block error at least very easily. Okay, So, what will be probability of block error? Remember this PE now is probability of block error. So far you may not have done that but in the coding case it is only probability of block error Okay, because my one symbol is actually what n dimensional it is huge it is one block. Okay, So, probability of error roughly can be written as what? Right? So, you have to have at least t plus 1 errors or larger. So, there is ways of writing it. So, you, you, if you worry about the constants and all that, you have to write a binomial formula, right? Summation, n choose, k, all these things you have to do. But I will say roughly it goes as what? p power what? Can I say roughly the 
leading factor will be p power t plus 1. Okay, so if you do all the simplifications, there might be a constant, okay, some constant uh, c, but or the leading term will be p power t plus 1. Okay, right. So you'll have actually if you look at the binomial expansion, you'll say n choose t plus 1, p power t plus 1 into 1 minus p power n minus whatever. But anyway, if you simplify everything, the leading term will be p power t plus 1. Okay, so if you have a error correcting capability, t for your code. Okay, so this is for an nk decode. Remember with syndrome decoding, with maximum likelihood decoding. Okay, so this is what it what goes as. Now this can be written as some constant times q 1 by sigma to the power t plus 1. Okay, so then you'll have to compare this expression with the other expression you had. And here you might need the exponential exponential approximation that we had before. So you see roughly you'll have a d by 2 factor. Okay. So, because t is d by 2, if you, if you write q as simply exponential, the numerator you will have a d by 2, around d by 2. Okay. So, so what do you think the penalty is for soft decoding, hard decoding versus soft decoding? In the soft decoding, we did not have a d by 2, right? the gain was from k d by n. Here, we seem to have a d by 2. So, roughly the figure of merit, I mean, rule of thumb is you will pay a 3 dB penalty in your coding game. 3 is fairly high, you really won't pay 3, maybe 2, 2 to 3 dB you will pay uh, if you do hard decision, okay, instead of doing soft decision, okay. Alright, so that's, that's a quick way of estimating. Of course, there are so many things that I've ignored here. So, because of that, you it won't quite be 3 dB, it will be lesser than that, okay. Okay, so that's all I want to say about block codes and uh, if you even if you didn't understand the techniques or you know didn't pay too much attention the important thing to remember is codes give you coding gain and block codes give you coding gain roughly just kd by n in the with some approximations okay so minimum distance is important you want to have good minimum distance and rate also plays a role okay so this is for block codes okay so in the next uh, 25 minutes or so i'm going to quickly run through an area begin an area which is it's called convolutional codes Okay, so it's slightly different from block codes, but it's also the same concept. Okay, but it turns out convolutional codes are described slightly differently. Block codes we described using generator matrix, parity check matrix, syndrome decoder, etc., etc., minimum distance and all that. For convolutional codes, we'll do something uh, slightly different in the description. We'll use a trellis for the description. Because we are using the trellis, maximum likelihood soft decoding becomes very, very efficient and easy for convolutional codes. Okay. Let me not say easy, efficiently implemented for convolutional codes. So because of that, convolutional codes are very, very popular even today. So, pretty much any system, wireless system you pick, will always have a convolutional code. Okay. So, so that's the reason why they're really, really popular. Okay. So, that's what we're going to start next. Hopefully, I'll be able to finish it in this class, but even if I don't, maybe a little bit, little bit of spillover into Monday is not too bad. Okay. So, so, for linear codes, when I introduce linear codes, I said the messages go out, the systematic linear codes, I basically said messages go out first and then you make parities, but we also have a non-systematic version where you keep doing parities, right? So, messages come in, you have k bits of message, every bit that is sent out is a XOR of chosen subset of the message bits. You take, pick a subset of message bits and keep doing it. But a complexity in this situation is, for different code word bits, you might have to choose different subsets of the message bits and that's an inf a thing that you have to store at the encoder. Right? The encoder has to store the entire P part of the generator matrix at least or the gen entire generator matrix in the uh, in the general case. Okay? So, you have to store all that and know what to XOR. Okay? So, what people do in convolutional codes is they kind of build a filter and then let it run at the encoder. Okay? So, you build a filter as in there are D flip flops, you shift bits in and then you XOR something out. So, it becomes a linear time invariant system. So, if you had a certain subset of bits which you XOR for getting one output, what will be the next output? Just one delayed version. Okay. So, for the encoder, it is really, really absolutely trivial. Okay. Is there a question at the end? I am fully unaware of even me stopping and asking them something. I can't disturb them any further. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the so that that simplifies complexity a lot okay so particularly in systems where you cannot afford any complexity in your encoding 
you want to put a simple encoder which doesn't have too much memory and this and that so this kind of a simple d flip flop implementation becomes very very popular okay so what we are going to do for convolutional codes is only look at some simple examples okay so and that's good enough most of the theory of convolutional codes is built around these simple examples and this this very rich very interesting theory but we will just look at some examples okay so this is what i'm going to do my message bits are coming in here okay so imagine a stream of bits of course it will be a block and you'll start and stop at some time but imagine a stream of bits coming in so maybe i index it as m sub k or some such thing okay so you, you let it go through say 2d flip flops here's an example remember 2d flip flops and you have two xors here okay for the first one maybe you pick i mean you can just do this arbitrarily but i'll just do you pick these two and for the next one you pick all three the new xor okay so you have one message sequence coming in and you put out two code word sequences okay so let me use some slightly different notation this m is a little bit confusing so i'll use u for the message sequence okay so remember this is basically u of 1 okay so i'll start with u of 0 u of 0 u of 1 so on okay the sequence of bits that are coming in okay the first output sequence i'll call it v1 okay so v1 and this is once again v1 of 1 v1 of 0 v1 of 1 so on okay the second output sequence i'll call v2 again v2 of 0 v2 of 1 so on okay so this is how my encoder works okay so if i have k message bits how many output bits will i have produced 2k maybe a little bit more because of the filtering delay and the memory clearing and all that so maybe a little bit more than 2k but roughly if k is very large that extra is very very small so k and 2k are quite okay Okay, so roughly this is a rate half encoder. Okay, and then you do what? You seem to be getting two sequences in parallel, but of course you make them serial and then send it out over BPSK. You do BPSK and then you send it over a channel. You receive it and then you have to do decoding. You get a vector R which you have to decode. Okay, so the only thing that changed was the way I did my uh, my uh, what my encoding. okay so what will be the after this first d flip flop what will this be so if this is un okay at the nth time instant what will be the uh, value after the first d flip flop un minus 1 the one after the second d flip flop un minus 2 so you see v1n has a very very simple expression it will be un plus un minus 1 plus u n minus 2 of course this is modulo 2 okay so i'm exoring the three of them okay so what about v2n it will be un plus un minus 2 okay so it's a very very simple uh, encoder it's as simple as it gets the only thing you need is two d flip flops okay which is really really trivial okay so you see why people who launch satellites for instance prefer to have convolutional codes in the satellite okay so the encoding that it does is trivial okay and you can imagine a satellite power is a power and energy are very seriously constrained resources okay so you have to get everything from the sun you may or may not get anything okay so this is uh, this is how a convolutional encoder will look okay so now the convolutional code is a little bit more complicated to define so i won't define it i'll simply say this is the convolutional encoder so now we have d flip flops we can quickly do a finite state machine model for the encoder okay so what will be your state state will be two bits u n minus 1 and u n minus 2 so how many possible states will there be four states okay and one input bit and two output bits corresponding to each thing okay so let me make a state diagram here it's a small state diagram it's very easy to do 0 0 1 0 one, 0 1 1 1 you can quickly do several transitions if you have zero input then it's going to be output 00 zero is the same similar to what we did for the uh, mlsd decoding right so same type of state diagram if you get a input 1 what happens you go to 10 and then the output is 11 one, one. okay so from 01 if you get a input 0 you come back here and the output is remember this is my 
u n minus one, and this is my u n minus two. Output is one one. Okay, and if you get a one, you go to one zero. Output has to be zero zero. All right. So if you have uh, one zero and you get a input zero, you should go to zero one. Input zero, you get uh, zero one, but the output is one zero. Then if you have get put one, the output would be zero one. Okay. Now if you have an input zero, it's going to go back to this guy right here. Output is going to be zero one. Then if you get, looks really ugly. I think. I think you can draw this in a much better way. I think you should have put one zero here and one one there. Anyway, so one zero. Okay, so that's my state diagram. Check this once again, I and mean, you must have done enough state diagrams like this. So this should not be anything new, but check it once again. It's very simple. I do a state diagram. So is there a question? Is it okay? So okay, so. Actually, I think it's better to put one zero down below and one one on the right. Then you'll get a much neater picture. So for some reason, I put one zero there, and picture became really ugly. Okay. So anyway, it doesn't matter. So, 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 so you should be comfortable doing this. This is, this is quite simple. There's no no big deal here. So remember what we have now. We have a state diagram description for the encoder. The only information that's missing in the state diagram description is the notion of time. So how do you bring in the time? You convert it into a trellis diagram. Okay, so you know initially you might have started with all zero state, right? You convert it into a trellis diagram, bring in the element of time, stage after stage. Whenever you complete, you might want to go back to the all zero state, and you should go back to the all zero state by terminating. Okay, and you push in enough zeros to terminate to go back to the all zero state. So you have a trellis description for your encoder. So now what will happen? Your transmitted symbols, which are on each branch of the trellis. Okay, so remember that. Next thing is, you go from state diagram to trellis. Okay, how will one stage of a trellis look? You have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. The next state once again will be zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Okay, so the transitions will be this way. Okay, and you can put, you can fill out all this, all this thing here. Doesn't really matter. Okay. So, so, so this is the stage of the trellis. Okay. To each trellis stage, each trellis stage, I have associated a two bits of output code word and one bit of an input message okay so i have one message bit which is input and these two are output code word bits okay is that clear so i have suppose if i have u of 0 to u of say k minus 1 as inputs this is the message the code word will be what I'll have V10, V20, all the way to V1, K minus 1, V2, K minus 1. Okay, I'll convert each of these guys into BPSK symbols, send them through what? Send them through, send them through uh, additive Gaussian noise and get a vector R. Suppose I have a vector R which is obtained from v okay how do i find 
V cap. The soft ML rule is to find do argument minimization over what? Okay, remember it's a trellis now. Okay, so I can say all valid paths in the trellis correspond to a code word. So I'll simply say minimum over trellis paths of what? I might put modulus R minus V square. Okay, but remember I can once again do the same trick as I did before. I can decompose this as a sum of several branch metrics and associate a branch metric to each branch and then run the Witter B to do this problem. So that's why soft ML decoding is very trivial for the uh, convolutional codes. Okay. So I don't want to do Witter B again and even the branch metrics also are very very simple. Okay. So it's just R minus V. So corresponding to 0, 0 if I received 1.1, 1.8. So what do you do? Simply do 1.1 minus 1 squared plus 0.8 minus 1 squared. You compute the branch matrix. So branch matrix are very trivial to compute. Like same as what you did for the MLST case. Okay. Once you compute that, just run Witter B, you get the same. Okay. So soft ML decoding becomes implementable as a Witter B algorithm. Okay, so this is a major, major, major selling point for convolutional codes. Okay, so it's very difficult to come up with block codes where the soft ML decoding is implemented. There's another version called bitwise MAP decoder, which is actually more popular today, and that can be implemented for both convolutional as well as for block codes. Okay, but the ML decoder is quite nasty. Okay, so it's very difficult to do it for block codes, and for the uh, for convolutional codes, it's it's very simple. Okay, so people know how to do Witter B. It's been beaten to death by all circuit designers. So it's readily available today. Any ch any chip you want, you can put put Witter B into it without occupying too much space. Well, pay some space, but not too much space. So people prefer to have Witter B decoder. So all your cell phones have a Witter B decoder built. Okay, so it's a very very popular code. It's out there everywhere. So convolutional codes are used. So you, so you can pick up any wireless standard. So it'll have a very simple convolutional code as a mandatory requirement that has to be implemented by everyone who wants to implement the standard okay so i showed you a very simple encoder which had just two states so typically this will be six in today's implementations convolutional codes people can do up to six states no six uh, i don't know memory length length of six d flip flops okay which means what how many states 64 states so 64 this is four state typically 64 state is done the reason is today 64 state Witter b is implementable these numbers tomorrow if 256 state Witter b is implementable what will happen it will go to 256 states. So higher the number of states, better the performance will be. Okay, so that's uh, that's the statement about convolutional codes. Okay, so like I said, they're really really popular. Okay, so so doing probability of error analysis is once again possible. So you can imagine how probability of error analysis will be done. How did we do it for MLSD? Anyone remembers? So you have to find the error events, right? So you have to find the error events. So you can do the same thing here. You have a trellis, find the minimum weight error events, do Q of error event by 2 sigma, the mag, the metric of that error event by 2 sigma, you get a rough estimate. Okay? So that's the big picture level description for convolutional codes. Okay, so that's all I wanted to do for coding, and with that, this course officially comes to an end. But before that, let me just maybe show you some pictures which I probably have. I mean, I should have it. And if I don't have it, it will be sad. So let me see. Okay, so this picture, is, I don't know if you can read the file name. Let me see. So can you see it? How do I zoom here? Can you see? Okay, so this is a picture of a simulation edit BER versus EBO and not. Once again, you can see log scale. Maybe you can't see the scale. This picture is a little bit bad. I think I did some JPEG compression, it became very bad. Okay, so this is in log scale, and this is EB over N0 and DB. This is for the Hamming code. Okay, so I have an uncoded curve, which is the black curve. I don't know if you can say it's the black one. The green curve is the leftmost one, which is soft ML decoding. Okay, so soft ML decoding for Hamming codes. How will I do it? I have to do 16 correlations. It's a little bit complicated, but you can do it. <coughs> and the red and the pink curve, which kind of intersects the other black curve, is the hard decision decoder. So you notice a lot of interesting things for the Hamming code. The hard decision decoder is bad for a while and then it becomes good when the 
when eb over n0 becomes really really large okay but the soft one is always better okay so it's, it's way better and you get the gains based on this okay so this is uh, hamming code i should have uh, okay so this one is a comparison of okay so this is from a book uh, uh, from a book by johansen and jigangiro some convolutional codes so it shows once again probability of error versus eb over n0 the uncoded bpsk curve is there you can read uncoded bpsk and the other curves are all performance curves for several other block codes so you say rs rs is reed solomon okay 256 comma 192 that's nnk okay but it's nnk in bytes it's not bits okay it's, it's in bytes so 256 192 is the rs code okay and rate is 3 by 4 and that's the performance curve so 10 power minus 6 it hits at around 6 db eb over n0 and then you have rate half bitter b m equals 6 so m is the memory so if it's m equals 6 then it's a 64 state bitter b decoder and you see its performance around 5 db it hits 10 power minus 6 so you see for a long time people thought it's difficult to go below this 5 db okay for a long long time people thought it was very difficult to go and very recent not very recently this has been nearly 15 years now when people published a paper saying uh, the turbo codes paper which went very very close to zero everybody doubted the simulation okay so it was entering so deeply that people doubted the simulation and not the result but today really 5 db is not acceptable you can go very very less much lesser than that okay so 5 db is what bitter b gives you it's a very simple thing okay the other three curves on the left are basically capacity curves so those tell you what's what's the maximum possible for different rates so you see for rate half approximately 0 db you can achieve 10 power minus 6 okay so but but there is a gap to be bridged and for that you need to know more advanced codes okay so maybe i'll show you something yeah i think this there is the rate half code so this is a uh, uh, this is nasty i don't want this picture okay so looks like okay so maybe i'll just throw this paper at you okay so this is a paper there you go that's the title okay so 0.0045 db of the shannon limit i hope they have the br plot ah uh, that's the br plot down here on the left you can see it it's br once again in log scale like i told you nb over n not in db scale okay so that's what's done so this is what you should do don't ask why okay and you see the shannon limit curve is there and then you have a lot of lines and those are actual points that are achieved by simulation okay so less than 0.25 db of eb or n not you can achieve 10 power minus 6 ber today okay so so that's that's where coding stands today so coding can pretty much take you to capacity today okay that's the story okay so how do we all right so so i think that that's the logical end to the course and i don't want to do anything more and uh, maybe we'll stop here